Good evening. Thank you, thank you. Uh, welcome and thank you for coming to this presentation of the E. Pauline Ryle Lecture Series. My name is Diane Allen and I am the Provost and Senior Vice President for Academic Affairs here at Salisbury University. I want to uh, say that I think the Ryle Committee has once again um, succeeded in bringing to campus a timely and provoking speaker, thought-provoking speaker. Uh, I know we're going to look forward to the insights. I spent dinner at his table and, um, wow, I wish we were still there talking. It was great listening to him. Um, a special thanks to Dr. Cheryl Parks, Dean of the Seidel School of Education and Professional Studies, and to Dr. Keith Connors, Chair of the Ryle Committee, for their excellent work in putting this together. And I would especially like to thank Mr. Esquith, our uh, speaker, for joining us tonight and making the, the incredible trip uh, that he had to make to be here. Most of you know that uh, Salisbury University was founded in 1925 as a normal school devoted to the preparation of teachers. And I, I was thinking to, today as I was walking across campus and I saw that very large structure that's going up there on Route 13, and that structure is right in the same place where our demonstration school existed, where Miss Ryle was the principal. And I wondered what she would think, think these 50 or 60 years later, what she would think about that kind of structure going up in place of that, what I thought was a fairly small building compared to that. Um, and I hope that she would be pleased that after all these years, as she still believes that learning is central to what we do here and that knowledge is important for us and that we still hold that as a value. So I think I would like to think that she would be very pleased with where we are. We are very proud of the teachers who have emerged from our doors and who continue to work with us as partners as we train new teachers every year. Um, I want to point out a particular partnership that we have with Mardella Middle and High School. Just three weeks ago, this partnership between Mardella and SU um, won or received the Exemplary Professional Development School Achievement Award at the 2015 National PDS Conference in Atlanta. Sir I certainly want to, to thank our partners at Mardella, but I would be remiss if I didn't recognize some folks here on campus who were uh, key to that achievement. So I'd like to ask Dr. Sires, Sarah Elburn, and Paul Gazier to stand and be recognized for this achievement. We still do great work here. And so without further delay, I will uh, invite Dr. Kelly Fiala to the podium to bring greetings. Thank you, Dr. Allen, and good evening, everyone. On behalf of the Seidel School of Education and Professional Studies, I'd like to welcome you to the Pauline Ryle Lecture Series. I know you're all eager to hear from tonight's guest speaker, Hezemai, so I'll keep my comments brief. I do want to take a moment to recognize a gifted teacher and leader who helped make this event possible. Mrs. Rael was born and, and raised on the Bay in Tiascan. She went away to Towson for teacher education, but she returned to the Eastern Shore where she taught and was the principal at the Salisbury University Campus School. Um, when Ms. Rael passed in the late 1980s, one of her bequests was that the Education Department bring this lecture series to expose students, faculty, and Salisbury community members to some of the leading minds in education. Without her generous support, this event would not be possible. Uh, now it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Keith Connors, Chair of the Rael Lecture Committee, who will um, introduce tonight's speaker. Thanks to all of you for supporting the Ryle Lecture Program as you do every semester. <clears throat> it's a Tuesday evening in late March. The weather has finally turned nice, and yet we've been able to fill virtually every seat in this auditorium. That's great. Thank you very much for coming. Before I introduce our speaker, I want to acknowledge some of the people who make this event possible. 
And I'd like to ask the members of the Ryle Committee in the Seidel School to please stand and be recognized. And that's Kim McCormick, Ron Sires, Ted Gilkey, <clears throat> Brandy Terrell, and our student representative, Morgan Hungerford. And a special thanks to two people behind the scenes who have handled all the logistical details of this event flawlessly. Our grad assistant, Romina Asprum, and go ahead, Romina, stand up. And our administrative assistant, Lisa Nowak. Thank you very much. Kappa Delta Pi, the International Honor Society for Education, has once again supplied the ushers and the booksellers in the lobby. Our speaker will be happy to sign copies of his books following the lecture in the social room. Several campus offices also played important roles. Facility reservations, public relations, publications, TV production, public safety, horticulture, and event services. And as he always does, Matt Hill of Event Services has wired this auditorium so that if your cell phone should ring during the lecture, all of your social media will be immediately sent to your parents, <laughs> including Yik Yak. All right. As noted, the Ryle Lecture is in its 27th year at Salisbury University. Your program indicates that the lecture is just part of the, uh, the Ryle legacy, as uh, uh, Dean Allen, uh, Provost Allen mentioned. And in her will, Pauline Ryle left money for scholarships for this lecture series and for an award given every year to the outstanding elementary or early childhood senior. The names of past Ryle winners are listed in the program. And tonight, at the Ryle Dinner, we were proud to host four of the former Ryle winners, and I think uh, most of them are still here right now. So I'd like Margaret Wolf, Kelly Thomas, Patricia Corpax, and Kara Tolson to please stand and be recognized. <laughs> you can read our speaker's bio in the program, so I won't repeat all of the information there. <clears throat> Rafe Esquith is very proud of all of the students who have passed through room 56 at Hobart School in, in California, and rightfully so. Many of them have gone on to prominent colleges and universities, places like Stanford, Harvard, and Princeton. But as impressive as these institutions are, I don't think any of the students from room 56 have made it to Salisbury University yet. So we have a little something for him to take back to his classroom to alert his students of what SU has to offer. Rafe, would you come up here, please? We have a Salisbury University pennant. And just to make sure you know where the top place is for teacher education, in case any of your students want to aspire to teaching, let's not forget who's number one. Ladies and gentlemen, Ray Fesquith. Thank you, folks. It's, it's my understanding that many of you have to be here tonight for credit, so I'm sorry you've been kidnapped to come here tonight. I really do. Uh, your evening's about to get a little bit worse. There is something I always tell an audience, um, and that is this. First of all, uh, uh, it's nice that I've been the National Teacher of the Year. It's nice that I'm the only teacher in history to get the Medal of the Arts from the President. It's nice getting the Compassion National Award from the Dalai Lama. Uh, it's nice being made a member of the British Empire by Queen Elizabeth. But the only thing of which I'm proud is that I am currently in my 32nd year as a public school classroom teacher. That's what I do for a living. I taught school. I taught school yesterday. I took a red eye to be here tonight. I will be in my class at 2 o'clock tomorrow afternoon rehearsing with the kids because they open in the winter's tale on April 23rd. And this is our spring break, so it's a busy time. Uh, the reason I wanted to apologize, I always tell people that um, years ago, 
I was teaching in my classroom, and we get 1,000 visitors a year visiting my class. And a guy walked in, and he was wearing a three-piece suit. I figured he was a teacher of some sort. And I said, can I help you, sir? And he said, no, Rafe, I'm not one of your teacher fans. I'm a private investigator, and I have been following you for the last month of your life, which scared the hell out of me. I said, what's up? And he said, I work for Oprah Winfrey. Do you watch her show? And I said, no, I don't watch Oprah Winfrey. I'm a teacher. Who's got time to watch television? <laughs> Grading papers. And he said, well, she's got this thing called the Angel Award. When she hears that people are doing good work, she will donate $100,000 to your cause. But people lie to Oprah. They go on her show and they scam her to sell their books and tell their stories. So she now hires people to vet you. If they think you're doing good work, they want to make sure that you really are doing good work. The investigator said, I've never in my life talked to anybody I've tailed. I just file a report, but I wanted to talk to you. He said, it's kind of a good news, bad news thing. He said, the good news is you're about to win Oprah Winfrey's Angel Award. She's going to give you $100,000, and you have the most astonishing class ever. No book, no movie will ever understand what you do with your kids. If everybody in the world were like your kids, there'd be no crime, there'd be no cancer, there'd be no pollution. It would be amazing. Congratulations, you're going to win the Angel Award. But the bad news, he said, I wanted to tell you face to face, you are the most boring man I have ever followed in my life. <laughs> he said, you don't do anything. He said, you go to a class, you work for 10 or 12 hours a day, you go home to your wife and kids. You have no parking tickets. You don't have any ex-lovers upset with you. People speak well of you. You don't have any, you don't have no drug abuse in your past. You're boring, man. You got to get a life. <laughs> so I wanted to apologize that you've been sucker tonight, that you're going to spend an hour with the most boring man you'll ever listen to. The second apology is that I'm a real straight shooter. And in an audience of this size, I almost certainly will offend some of you. And I apologize. If I do offend you, please remember that Socrates was the best teacher who ever lived, and they killed him. So <laughs> I think good teachers ask some difficult questions. So let me tell you about what I do. Before I do, and this is the most maybe important thing I'm going to say, I go to these events a lot. I sit where you're sitting, and some celebrity teacher stands up here and tells you, this is what you need to do. And they're arrogant and they've been reading their press clippings too much. I don't have all the answers. I just have some ideas. If you've ever gone to Italy, drivers in Rome will tell you that traffic lights are just suggestions. <laughs> These are just suggestions. It's my hope that you walk out of here tonight with a couple of ideas that you can use in your classrooms. That's all. But if you disagree, great, do it your way. So. I teach at a place called Hobart Elementary School in Los Angeles, California. It is the classic urban nightmare. It is surrounded by a 16-foot chain link fence locked at every possible corner. I still haven't figured out if that's to keep the gangs out or the kids in. It might be both. It's a tough place to get in or out. In my classroom, you are not allowed to drink the water. It's been deemed unsafe by the city of Los Angeles. Really. 92% of the kids are below the poverty level. Nobody speaks English as a first language. It's not an easy place to work. All the kids get free breakfast and free lunch every day. And here is the statistic that just kills me. Only 32% of the kids at this elementary school finish high school. 68% of Hobart students are out of school by the age of 17. And I got there over a quarter of a century ago, and I just said, that's not acceptable. I am not going to do what the other teachers are doing, because obviously it's not working. My students are not part of that percentage. The great majority of my students go on to top universities, and more importantly, live extraordinary lives. And I want to show you some of the things I do. When people come to my class, there are two things they're amazed by. And the first one is, the kids behave really well. I mean really well. If I leave the classroom, nothing changes. They had a rehearsal today. In class, it's spring break. There's no one on campus. They 
have a way of breaking into the school, which I taught them. <laughs> and I just got off the phone with them. They had a great rehearsal, no adults there, 60 students rehearsing, a three-hour production. Not a problem. The school is locked down for the night. When I take my students traveling, I can take 50 kids on the road, no chaperones, none. My wife and me, that's it. Why do they behave so well? I'm going to give you three things that we do. Again, you don't have to use them. Just think about it. Put it through your own way of teaching. But for all my young teachers here, if you only remember one thing that I say tonight, here's the most important rule of teaching. You are a role model. You must be the person you want the kids to be. I want my kids to be nice. That means I got to be the nicest guy they've ever met, even on days when I want to throw them out the window. <laughs> if you are screaming at the students to be nice, that's a mixed message. I want my students to work hard. That means I've got to be the hardest worker they've ever seen. It can't be by lecture. It must be by example. If you don't think the kids watch you constantly, you are sadly underestimating their powers of observation. Now, I'm sorry to be so hard on teachers, but I come to a lot of events like this, and I look out into the audience, and I see the teachers texting, talking to each other, they're on their cell phones, they're not paying attention, but these same teachers expect to stand in front of a group of students and say, listen up. It doesn't work that way. Why are my students so well behaved? I am. All the time. All the time. If you aren't, you don't have a right to ask the kids to behave in any way if you don't do it yourself. Be the person you want the kids to be. Now, the second reason my kids behave well, and this is not popular to say these days, so get ready to get mad at me, I don't give a damn about the test at the end of the year. Of course I test children. If I teach kids to multiply, I give them a test. The only reason I do that, I want to see if they know the material. And if they don't, we learn it again. But to make some test at the end of the year the be-all and end-all of their existence is ridiculous. The real assessment is where are the kids 10 years after they've left my classroom, 20 years? What have I given them that they will be using, not for a test, not for my class, but skills they will use in their life? That's what schools should be about. And the reason my kids behave well, they are excited because they feel that they're learning something worthwhile. I don't care about the test at the end of the year. I'm sorry. We do well on them, but as I teach my students, my wife didn't fall in love with me because of my test scores. I was not invited here to speak to you tonight because I had high grades in school, which I did. But that's such a small part of the picture. And the third reason my kids behave well, and people talk to me about this from all over the world, is starting from day one, I teach my students Lawrence Kohlberg's six levels of moral development. I challenge the children to look at their behavior and ask themselves why they behave in the way they behave. We train most children to be level one thinkers. Level one is, I'll do my work in school, I'll pay attention, because I'm afraid that if I don't, I'm going to get in trouble. But that's not why we're in school, to avoid trouble. I don't put kids' names on the wall. I don't use things like dojo classroom and grade their behavior and humiliate them. We don't do math to avoid trouble. We're not reading to avoid trouble. We can go way beyond level one thinking. Level two thinking, very popular in schools these days. I do things because I want a reward. I want an A a piece of candy, a gold star. In my school, they do this ridiculous thing, except in my class, where if kids read books, they give you a certificate. 
I tell my kids, you don't need a reward for reading a book. Reading a book is the reward. You don't need ridiculous rewards. We do a Shakespeare play after, every year. We don't have a cast party. Being in the play is the party. You don't need some superficial activity to be proud of yourself. Now, to prove to you that kids love thinking about the six levels, a couple of years ago, my principal called an assembly because our lunch area was filthy, absolutely filthy. All those breakfasts and lunch every day, big cockroaches the size of a Buick running around. It was really bad. Mice, rats, the whole thing. So he called an assembly and told the kids, you guys, we're going to monitor your tables. If you guys will keep your area clean for a week on Friday, you'll get a popsicle. And my class all looked at each other and went, level two, level two, there it is, level two. And at the end of that week, when they were offered a popsicle because they had a clean table, my class turned them down. Now, there's nothing wrong with having a popsicle with your kids. I like a popsicle. But not for keeping your table clean. We do that because it's hygienic. Let's get rid of bribery. Let's be teachers. We don't have to bribe the children. They're far more forward-thinking than you're giving them credit. Then there's level three. This is really popular, especially in the primary grades. I do things to please my teacher. I hold up my art project. Hey, Rafe, what do you think? Is it good? Is it good, Rafe? What do you think? I laugh at the student and say, why are you asking me? It's your art project. It doesn't matter what I think of it. What do you think of it? Leave me out of it. I'm just your teacher. You're not here to work for me. You're here to work for you. You'll see this in schools all the time. The principal is coming to pay a visit. And the teacher tells the students, hey, kids, sit up. Shut up. The principal is coming. Behave yourself. Don't make me look bad. I tell my students, if you're running around, I don't look bad. You look bad. I look fine. It has no reflection on me whatsoever. Your behavior is your own behavior. Now, very popular in school is level four. I do things because it's the rule. We put 10,000 rules on the walls of our classroom, and you have to do your math because rule 27 says do your math. Now, I'm not an anarchist, but when I go to a hospital, I'm not quiet because there's a rule that says be quiet on the wall. I'm aware. It's a hospital. It's not the beach. People are sick. Doctors are working. Families are worried or grieving. So we can go beyond the rules, which takes us to level five. Level five is that I do things because I am considerate of other people. I am quiet in a hotel room when I'm on the road with Rafe, and I'm not quiet because I'm afraid I'm going to get in trouble. I'm not quiet because I'm going to get a reward. I'm not quiet to please Rafe, and I'm not quiet because of a rule that says be quiet. I'm quiet because I am aware that there are people in the other rooms, and I have respect for them, and they might be trying to sleep. So if you can get your kids to the fifth level, you've done a great job. But the highest level of moral development, level six, is when children internalize a personal code of behavior that they carry with them no matter what their surroundings are. They are honorable in a dishonorable world. They are kind when surrounded by meanness. And they are honest when they are surrounded by dishonesty. And all through our year, in literature and film and real life, my students and I search for that sixth level. Now, just to show you what it looks like, let me talk about Felix. Felix was one of my students who would not be considered, according to the Common Core, the best student in my class. He was a good student, but he didn't have the highest math grades, the highest reading grades. What Felix was really known for he had the most beautiful blonde hair you have ever seen. He was a boy from Mexico, and he had golden, long, thick hair all the way to his shoulders. And he would run around on the playground. You could see his mane flying from 100 yards away. 
Amazing. Like a lot of my former students, Felix would come back to visit me when he went on to middle school and high school. And one day when he was in the ninth grade, he came back to visit. He opened the door and all of my fifth graders went, oh! and I turned around and I looked and Felix was bald. Absolutely head shaven. Nothing. I mean, not short hair, a mirror on his head. And I said, Felix, what happened? That's quite a fashion statement. Did you run out of shampoo? And he said, no, Rafe, there's a girl in my school who has cancer. And she's going through chemotherapy. And all of her hair fell out. She is embarrassed and she is terrified. And so every day she wears a scarf around her head and a hat on her head. And the other day at school, the other kids pulled off her hat, unwound her scarf, pointed at her, and said, you're going to die. He said, so I cut off my hair and gave it to her. That's the sixth level. Now, he may not have my highest test scores, but that is my best student. That's the boy who I'd like for a neighbor one day. That's the boy I'd like to marry my daughter one day. These are the conversations I encourage you to have with students. I have teachers from around the world write to me and say, Rafe, I love the six levels, but we've done it for a week and we haven't made it to level six yet. <laughs> what am I doing wrong? You're not doing anything wrong. It's just a conversation to get the kids to think about why they behave in the way they do. Now, since I couldn't bring my students tonight, I brought you three clips. And the first clip we're going to show you won an Emmy Award on the Today Show about 10 years ago. And the reason I want to show you this clip, first of all, you can see what Room 56 looks like. But the best part of this clip, and I hope you'll watch carefully, you're going to meet three of my students when they're 20 years old and how they're doing. One's at NYU, one's at Pomona, and one is at Yale Law School. This is the real assessment of teaching. So can we please show that first clip on the Today Show? Thank you. Fifth graders in Los Angeles thrilled to be spending their summer in school because of a very special teacher. Our national correspondent, Jamie Gangel, has that story. Jamie, good morning. Good morning, Matt. With almost 2,000 students, Hobart Elementary is one of the largest schools in the country, but also one of the most challenged. 92% live below the poverty line, and almost all of them speak English as a second language. But Hobart also has a secret weapon. When the couple comes back, Polixenes chases them. 51-year-old oh. Rafe Esquith teaches okay. fifth grade like, like no one else. Why is 49 a buzzword? There you go. Okay, very good. You got to think before you speak. Dedicated and passionate, he starts class at 6 a.m. One, a toast to the bride and groom, Jake announced, raising his glass of ginger ale. Goes until 6 p.m. 15 points. And there is no summer vacation. Can you name one of the other two states to touch the Gulf of Mexico? Why do you work so hard? I saw kids who were four and five years behind grade level simply because they didn't speak English as their first language or their parents couldn't afford private tutoring. It wasn't that they didn't have good parents, but they had poor parents. And I guess we all like justice. We like justice. And this is supposed to be a land of equal opportunity. So I decided somebody has to level the playing field. To accomplish that, Rafe, as everyone calls him, created his own curriculum. Lesson one, there are no shortcuts. Now let's go over one more time the strategy. Lesson two, so behavior should... must be exemplary. You're a good sport, okay? The mission of our class is be nice, work hard. If you want to be good at algebra, you have to work at it. If you want to understand literature, you have to work at it. And that's why there are no shortcuts. Lesson three. To be or not to be. Shakespeare and rock and roll. Each year, the students master a play and put it to music. Henry IV gets the Beatles. Why Shakespeare? I like Shakespeare. My father read him to me when I was a little boy. And I think the music is the glue that holds our class together. I really do. It's just great fun. And children that study music 
do better in everything. They're learning about discipline and practice and taking risks. And those lessons carry on whether they're studying algebra or literature or geography. That's your name, I hear. Well, have you heard but something hard of hearing? They call me Captain that do talk of me. The Hobart Shakespeareans have become so accomplished, they have performed around the world. <laughs> Sir Ian McKellen is a fan and benefactor. You can't watch those little actors who know the words so well and their meaning so well uh, without wanting to cry. And I, I, why do you cry? I, th I think it's, it's happiness, really. And a regret that not every child in the world could have a Rafe Esquith. Now the president off stage the students are also models of success test results have soared and it shows on a class trip to Washington DC they look at one thing the law. the law and what is our law called the constitution the constitution they look at the law what's it been like being in Rafe's class this year it's been really fun cuz we do hard work but then if we have fun so like time flies in the class it's been worth it because Rafe, he gives us a lot of advice on life. He's always with us every step of the way. And when it's really hard for us, he always makes jokes. So it's not really that hard. <laughs> Are his jokes really good? Yes. yes! For most teachers, that would be more than enough. But Rafe Esquith is driven. On Saturdays, he tutors former students for the SATs. Once you've gone through all the problems that you can do easily, go back and look at the pluses. Then runs next right, door to help others with math. Boys and girls, algebra. Take a little library and walk up those steps. And every year he finds a week to take a group on college tours. Very difficult to get in here. Oh, and yes, he does have a personal life. His wife, Barbara, is his co-conspirator. The two of you have given up your lives. No, we've enriched our lives. We haven't given up our lives. All these people think I'm so crazy. All these ideas were Barbara's idea. Barbara will say, you know what, if I've got an idea, and that's when I start running for the hills, because her ideas are great, and I'm the guy who has to kill myself making them happen. There is a and connection. what few people know is Sit that for years, Rafe has paid for all these special ideas, trips, and programs out of his own pocket, sometimes working three extra jobs. You've been teaching for how many years now? This is my 24th year. 24 years. You have been named Teacher of the Year. You've gotten awards from presidents. You've been given an award by the Queen. Yep, I'm a member of the British Empire. May I ask how much money you make? Yeah, I made $42,000 last year. You could make more money. You could go to a different school. Sure. You could be a principal. Sure. By now. Why not? You were in the room today. <laughs> I have the greatest job in the world. There is no way I would ever leave that place. But even Rafe realized he could use some help. So a few years ago, one of his former students, Matt Parlow, started a foundation while he was at Yale Law School. And I remember calling him up and telling him, I said, you know, you saved me, now I'm going to save you. It is a sentiment echoed by many former students. Well, I really almost see him as a father figure in my life. He's putting his life on the side to, you know, make a difference in these kids' lives. One word to describe him? Hero. Hero. He's my hero. Because? For what he did for me um, in helping me realize my potential and in instilling in me a love of learning. For someone who is changing children's lives every day, Rafe modestly dismisses such praise. It appears this teacher needs his students as much as they need him. What's the biggest compliment someone could pay you? There's nothing. I'm just a regular teacher. I'm an ordinary teacher. There's no compliment to pay me. The compliment should be for those kids who voluntarily work so hard. What's your goal for these kids? My goal for these kids is to get skills from me that they are using five years from now, ten years from now. I want them to be happy, and I want them to be doing something they love to do. That's why I'm a lucky man. I do something I love to do. You want to do that? Rafe likes to joke that he's crazy. Matt, we could use a lot more crazy teachers just like him. 
hardest job in the world has to be being a sixth grade teacher <laughs> in his school. How do you follow that act? You, you can't, but he sticks with these kids. He, through middle school, high school, right on. Wonderful, wonderful story, Jamie. Thanks very much. So we've talked about why my students behave so well, but why do they work so hard? Here's something all of you can take away tonight. A very simple bit of language that I hope you'll use with your students. If you ask most kids in school who are doing math or writing an essay, why are you doing that? What will they tell you? I have to. My teacher told me to. Sometimes they say, I don't know why I'm doing it, which at least is honest. I teach my students a different answer, and I hope you'll do this with your kids. If you ask one of my students, why are you doing math? He will put down his pencil, look you right in the eye, and say, if I learn this skill, my life just got better. If I learn this skill, my life just got better. And every lesson I teach, we take a moment to make sure they understand why they are learning it and how they will use it in their life. My students never worry about preparing for a test. They never worry about their grades. They never worry about pleasing me. They worry about learning skills that they will find useful and relevant. Let me give you an example. Here's something really fun you can do. I want my students to know about money. Because if you can manage money, your life is going to be better. And as college students, you know that's true. So on the first day of school, all of my fifth graders have to apply for a job. We've got bankers and janitors and recycling monitors and ball monitors and police officers, all kinds of jobs. And the kids get a banking ledger and they get paid to do their job in class money. But it's real money in our classroom. I never tell them to do their job. My principal doesn't have to remind me to do my job. If you have a job to do, you have to do it. And if you do your job, you get paid at the end of the month. But there is a problem. Because in room 56, you have to pay rent to sit at your desk. <laughs> you do. And the closer you sit to the front of the room, the more rent you have to pay. It's a better neighborhood. <laughs> now, I'm so devious that after about an hour, the kids figure something out. They go, now, wait a minute, Rafe. I'm a ball monitor. You're paying me $600 a month but it costs $1,000 to sit in this seat. I won't be able to pay my rent. And I say, I know, it's a lot like being a teacher. <laughs> and I tell them, if you don't pay your rent, I'm sorry, I'll have to evict you from your seat and you will have to sit on the floor as a homeless person. It never happens, because the kids have dozens of opportunities to earn extra money. If they join our after-school Shakespeare program, play a musical instrument, come in early to do extra math, you get tons of bonus money, nobody winds up on the floor. And by the way, I never pay for behavior. That's the second level. But you get paid for work, because that's what happens in a capitalistic society. Now, at the end of the month, I sell things. Because when the kids have extra money, we have an auction, and they can bid for books, and Barnes and Noble gift certificates, and calculators, and school supplies. But the really smart kids don't buy anything. Because in room 56, if you can save up triple your rent, you can buy your seat, call it a condominium, and never have to pay rent again to teach them the principle of ownership. But the really smart kids buy other children's seats and charge them rent every month. <laughs> of course. If you own seats, you have to pay property taxes twice a year. And on April 15th, all the kids have to fill out forms and do income taxes. It's true. Now, for those of you interested in trying this, by the way, the US Department of Treasury thinks this is so brilliant, they're spending $400,000 to study it and try and put it in classrooms all across the country. Now, there is a website that's free for teachers the guy who owns the Vanguard Insurance Group read one of my books, thought it was the coolest thing he ever heard. So they started a website called myclassroomeconomy.org. Myclassroomeconomy.org. It's free. And on the website, whether you're teaching kindergarten or 12th grade,
There are activities you can do to teach your kids how to manage money. Why is this important? A couple of years ago, I got a letter from one of my former students, Helen, who was a student at Washington and Lee University in Virginia. And like a lot of juniors, she was studying abroad. And she said, Rafe, it's hilarious. All the kids over here are wiring their parents. Mom, dad, send money. I'm out of money. She said, Rafe, I don't have to wire my parents. I don't need money. I have enough money. I know how to handle money. I learned it in the fifth grade. That's an assessment of teaching, not the test at the end of the year. So please, thank you. Relevance, relevance, relevance. My students love to read. How could that be in this day and age? I'm going to show you a clip in a minute to show you how much they love it. Why do they love it? Because I will not read any of those god-awful state reading books with the kids. I took all the books that had been banned and we read them. <laughs> My fifth graders read with me. Steinbeck's of Mice and Men, Tom Sawyer, Huck Finn, Malcolm X, Catcher in the Rye, Separate Peace, Christmas Carol, Orwell's Animal Farm, and my personal Bible, To Kill a Mockingbird. Yes. But the days of telling kids to go home and read a book, it's over. They're just going to go online and cheat. I read every word and every page with them. I am the role model. But the books are so good, and because I'm a positive role model, they love to read. I teach them every great book is about you. It's not about Huck Finn's trip down the river. It's about your trip down the river and the moral dilemmas you will face and the moral decisions you will have to make. To show this to you, I want to show you, I want to tell you about a kid named Rudy. If there was ever a kid who should have been a loss forever, it was Rudy. Rudy was one of seven children. Four of them were special ed, and I mean severely so. Huge substance abuse in the family. His parents had a knife fight in front of the school once before divorcing. When Rudy came to my class, he was a mess. Today, he is a graduate of NYU. But I want to show you that when we make our lessons relevant, when it's about their life, I want to show you what it can mean for a child. I, when Rudy was at NYU, for those of you who don't know, NYU's great school, terrible financial aid, living in New York is not easy. Rudy was struggling, I heard, through the grapevine, and I'm not a rich guy, but I had about 300 bucks in my checking account, and I sent him the money. He sent the check back to me with this letter. And I want you to listen to what he says about reading and what happens when we read with kids every day. Rudy said, Rafe, as far as the money goes, I can't ask of you to give of yourself like that. As I said, I can do this on my own. I just need to work a little harder and cut down on my expenses. I would feel terrible knowing that energy that could be devoted to a kid started on the path you got me on would be wasted on me when I can manage just fine. I appreciate your willingness to help me. It reminds me that you're one of the best people I know but I'd much rather have the money you're offering me go to the class so that one day some other kid will be in a position like mine. And while I'm on that subject, I've got to tell you, I tell our story to anyone who will listen. Rafe, I honestly believe that I would be dead right now if it wasn't for you. I was headed down a dark path where drug dealing didn't seem so bad and the acceptance of a gang was looking like the only way to be accepted. You saved me from that. And now I'm at a top university studying an art I never would have tried had you not cast me in a play. You showed me a better life, a better way to live. When I tell people about the class in you, I have found myself comparing what you did for me to Plato's allegory of the cave. I knew only pain and disappointment and thought that was the way of the world until I met you. I thank God I did. Well, I had to look up Plato's allegory of the cave because I had no idea what the hell Rudy was talking about. But here's a kid who reads for all the right reasons now. He's reading great works of literature and applying them to his life. 
not worrying about what's going to be on number 23 on the test. So I'm going to show you a clip now that was made from a PBS documentary of my students reading Huck Finn. And for those of you who have forgotten, you're going to see one of the great chapters in all of literature. It's the climactic moment when Huck has to decide whether to turn Jim in, make him a slave again, and accept society's ways, or not turn Jim and eventually go to hell. Watch these kids when we read great literature with them, which you can do. Read with them every day. And you don't have to read the books I like. What books do you like? Put yourself in the classroom, and your class can look like this. Let's watch fifth graders at 10 who don't speak English read Huck Finn. Many of the great books that we read in this classroom have to do with the struggles of being young and growing up. And the kids really relate to them because they're young and they're facing the struggle of growing up. So we read Huck Finn. We read Catcher in the Rye. We read A Separate Piece. We read Lord of the Flies. And we always read To Kill a Mockingbird. We read the autobiography of Malcolm X. We always read Of Mice and Men by John Steinbeck. In chapter 31, in just a few minutes, it will be time for Huck finally to do the right thing and turn Jim in and make him a slave. And that is the right thing, isn't it, boys and girls? It is the right thing. Don't you think? That's what society is telling him. And then I happen to look around and see that paper. It was a close place. And I held it in my hand, and I was a trembling. Because I got to decide forever betwixt two things, and I noted. it. I studied a minute, sort of holding my breath, and then says to myself, all right then, I'll go to hell, and tore it up. Danielle, will you leave Danielle? Then I set to thinking over how to get it out, it, and turned over considerable many ways in my mind, and at last fixed a plan that suited me. It's okay. I told you, it's powerful stuff. It's real powerful stuff. So what decision did Huck make? The climax is over. He's going to be... He'll be a bad boy. He'll be a bad boy, at least according to this world he will. But what he's really going to be is he's going to be himself. He's not going to let the society tell him what to do. And isn't that a decision that all of you have to make. Society's going to tell you how to dress, what to play, what pop group to listen to, how to cut your hair. Isn't that ridiculous? Each of you is so individually special. I hope you guys make these kinds of decisions in your life. Thank you. You can do this. You can do this. Read with your kids every day. But now comes the best part of the evening. I'm 61 years old. I'm in my 32nd year. People ask, Rafe, how the hell do you have so much energy? You got four kids, you got two grandchildren. Don't you get discouraged? Sure I do. So what keeps me going? Here's the great secret. When you become teachers, the system is going to tell you what to do and how to do it. Sir Ken Robinson, who's a really good friend of mine, has said that teachers have become FedEx workers, delivering packages from the district that they have no connection with and just shipping them to the students. I want to ask each of you, what do you like to do in your own life? Do you like to cook? Then you should cook with your students. Are you, are you a runner? Start a marathon club. Do you sew? Do you like, what do you do? Don't take yourself out of the classroom. Every year, find ways to put you in the classroom, and you're going to be a much happier teacher, and the kids will be happier. Now, by the way, it doesn't mean that these things always work. Let me share with you one of the stupidest mistakes I ever made, but it's pretty funny. 
I'm out in Hollywood, so I love movies. And I used to get really sad on Monday mornings because I would always ask the kids, what did you do on the weekend? And the kids would say, we watched a video. And I'd say, what'd you watch? And these kids would say, Saw, <laughs> Friday the 13th, part 12, <laughs> Freddy kills everybody. And I was like, are you kidding me? Oh yeah, my dad watched with me. He thought it was really cool when his eyes popped out. And I'm like, oh my God. And I would rant at the kids like they're going to listen to me, you know? Like the kids are going to say, thank you, Rafe. Thank you for pointing out the errors in my cinematic viewing. <laughs> From now on, I'm only going to watch films recognized by the American Film Institute. Well, that's not going to happen. So out of desperation, I said, I want to give the kids an alternative. So I started realizing that when kids watch film, they ask the wrong questions. They ask, is it in black and white or color? <laughs> is it long or is it short? Is it new or is it old? Instead of, is it good or is it bad? And what makes a film great? Now, I'm sorry if this offends anybody, but Transformers is not a great movie. <laughs> Nobody's going to study it in 20 years. <laughs> the Wizard of Oz is a great movie. Citizen Kane is a great movie. There are great foreign films. So I started collecting every kind of genre from every country on Earth. And on Fridays, the kids could check out a film but I provided a set of written questions to help the kids with their English skills. I thought it was a great idea, but there were some startup problems. You see, <laughs> the first year, my class was gonna to go to Philadelphia and we were gonna spend some time in the Amish country in Pennsylvania. So I let Pablo Alvarez, age 10, take home the great Peter Weir film, Witness with Harrison Ford. <laughs> It's a very good movie. Now, for those of you unfamiliar with Witness, Harrison Ford plays a tough Philadelphia cop who uncovers a terrible police scandal of murder and drug abuse, and he winds up hiding out at an Amish farm where he falls in love with the beautiful Amish woman, Kelly McGillis. And there is a scene when Harrison Ford walks in on Kelly McGillis, taking a bath, and you see her breasts. Monday morning. <laughs> About 6.30 in the morning, Pablo's mother comes in. Never have I had a parent that pissed at me, ever. Now, my Spanish wasn't that good in those days, but she gave me the cussing of my life. She was going to fire my ass and go down to the district and just kill me. And she went on and on, and I said, why are you so upset? Oh, my God, the breasts, the breasts. Her child had seen the bad stuff, the breasts. Now, in my defense, may I point out that earlier in that film, Danny Glover cuts a guy's throat in the bathroom. That was okay with mama. <laughs> Cutting throats, okay, breasts, not okay. But I had to learn, I had to work with the parents. I had to start to realize that families have different uh, rules of acceptability, and I had to be much more careful in which kid took home which film. Now, the punchline of this story, she would have yelled at me longer, but she was in a hurry that morning because Pablo's little sister, who was eight years old, was staying home because she, the mother believed that the daughter was possessed and a priest was coming over to perform an exorcism. <laughs> and as she left my classroom, I wanted to say, exorcism, have I got a film for you? But I didn't say that. <laughs> the, I tried something new, I fell on my face, but now I will tell you years later, the film club is wildly successful and I have students who work in Hollywood, one of them even works with Scorsese. And it all started because I tried something new. But the newest idea, and this is the best part of the evening, who are you? What do you like to do? I love Shakespeare and I love rock and roll. You don't have to, he's my guy. 30 years ago, I made a mistake. I had an idea of teaching Shakespeare to the children, but I made the mistake of breaking the first rule of teaching. Never ask permission. Ask forgiveness later on. 
I wrote a proposal for the people downtown and said, my students cannot speak English well. We are going to stay after school, and any kid who wants to can stay with me, it's voluntary, and learn some Shakespeare after school. I don't need to be paid, I don't need anything. But because there are alarms in room 56, when you hear the alarms going off at 3.30, we're not being burglarized, it's just me. The proposal was rejected. I still have this letter. The people downtown said, Rafe, we don't want you to do Shakespeare with the kids. It would be better if you did something academic. <laughs> because I was a coward, that first year instead, we didn't do Shakespeare. We did the great play Our Town by Thornton Wilder. Anybody know Our Town by Thornton Wilder? I see the heads. Great play, easy to do, not a lot of sets, very simple. And we worked really hard, we put the play on. I invited the region superintendent of Los Angeles schools to watch Our Town. She loved it, she cried at the end when Emily died. She came up to me and said, Rafe, I have never seen Shakespeare done better. <laughs> so young teachers understand, a lot of the time you're just alone. People are not going to understand what you do. 30 years ago, when I proposed Shakespeare, here's what happened to me. Everybody yelled at me. You can't do that! Our kids can't understand Shakespeare! Don't you know what our kids are? Don't you know who they are? What about liability problems? What if somebody falls after school? What if somebody gets hurt? What if the parents complain? How are you going to select them? What if a parent is upset with the program? How are you going to decide who gets what part? You can't do this! It's impossible! Well, now it's 30 years later. The Hobart Shakespeareans have been recognized by the Royal Shakespeare Company as the ultimate example of how and why Shakespeare should be done. And they are considered the finest group of Shakespeareans on the planet. And the people who 30 years ago said, that's impossible! They're dead. <laughs> Stand up for yourself. Show a little courage. And work your magic with what you like to do. I would like to show you, and I really hope you'll watch, some clips that I brought for you of the Hobart Shakespeareans. You don't have to like Shakespeare. It's got nothing to do with Shakespeare. Watch these kids speak the language. Look at their clarity and absolute understanding of the material and ask yourself, how well will these kids interview for a job one day? How well will they do an oral presentation in school? Watch their music. You will not only see kids, see, see kids playing guitar and piano and drums, you're even going to see a kid playing the sitar. You're going to see cellos and flutes. Do we have any Bjork fans here? Okay. You're going to see from last year, the kids doing Army of Me and people who watch this clip go, did you go into a studio? How did you get that sound? Uh-uh. This is a live, one-take performance. They're just that good. I've seen Bjork do this on stage with her band. These kids are better. They, you'll see, they really are that good. You will see a scene where the kids are crying. Why are they crying? They are crying because school is over. And they are brokenhearted that their year is over. Most kids celebrate on vacation. These kids cry. You are going to see kids so fearless that they are going to dance and take their clothes off down to their underwear and dance in front of you because the arts, the arts, the arts bring out the best in our students. Finally, you're going to see, watch the kids do the Rolling Stones when they do a Rolling Stones song with choir chimes. Look at their concentration. In an era when they say kids can't pay attention anymore, have them play music and you're going to get their attention. When you can dream big, you can even see what happens when William Shakespeare meets Elvis Presley. So, I really appreciate what a great audience you've been. Let's spend six minutes and have a lot of fun with my favorite words, the Hobart Shakespeareans.
What's his reason? I am a Jew! <laughs> Have not the Jew eyes! Have not the Jew hands, organs, dimensions, senses, affections, passions! Fed with the same food, hurt by the same weapons, subject to the same diseases, healed by the same means, warmed and cooled by the same summer and winter as a Christian is. If you prick us, do we not bleed? If you tickle us, do we not laugh? If you poison us, do we not die? And if you wrong us, shall we not revenge? This is Ian McKellen, okay? He's a really nice guy, okay? And uh, these are the newest Shakespeareans. The best, the best thing about the Hobart Shakespeareans is that they know what they're saying, you know? We work very hard. I know you work hard, and yeah. you understand every single word, and uh, that couldn't be said of all actors who do Shakespeare. <laughs> really good. twangling instruments will hum about mine ears, and sometimes voices that if I waked after a long sleep will make me sleep again. And in dreaming, the clouds we thought would open and show riches red drop upon me, that when I waked, I cry to dream again. Oh, Helen, goddess, <laughs> perfect, divine, to what, my love, should I compare thy nine? Crystals, muddy, oh, how ripe and show, thy lips, those kissing cherries, tempting grow. Oh, let me kiss this princess of pure white, this seal of bliss. Oh, <laughs> oh, smite. oh hell, I fear all that, to sell a busy for your merriment. Hello, am I? Thou, pray to me, Lord! Speak! Hell, no, am I? Am I not getting so long as I'm going to... Go, 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 go
to be gentlemen. Oh, not hurt me. memory for you but it's one of many great memories to come. The readiness is all. all. Closing, let me also point out, the plays are done in our classroom with t-shirts and jeans. We're offered Broadway, we've been offered the West End in London, we've been offered every Asian country on the planet. Why don't we go there? Remember, what's the objective? Language, teamwork, the development of human beings. Going to Broadway just makes you famous. Putting on costumes, that's showbiz. We are teachers, we're trying to educate. So let's always remember what we're here for. So in closing, let me ask you this question. Who's already student teaching here? And would you agree with me? Let's be honest. How many of you have had bad days? And you think you're failing and you haven't made a difference, right? May I respectfully disagree with you and say, you don't know that. You don't know that. Sometimes your lessons kick in 20 years from now because you spent time with that kid. It's painful, but it's a fact about teaching. And to prove it to you, many years ago, I took 41 kids to New York City to perform, my wife and me, and we went to the Empire State Building. Has anybody ever been there? If you haven't, you have to wait in a long line. <laughs> and it goes through this lobby, and while you're in line, they have all these extra things that you can do where you pay extra money. They always want your money. 
And on this particular morning, I was with the kids alone. My wife, Barbara, was sick, and I had the 41 kids with me. Now, there is a ride you can go on. It's a virtual reality ride. You pay money, you go into a theater, the theater shakes, and you take a wild ride through New York City. And I asked the kids if they wanted to go on, and they said, yeah. But to go on this ride, you have to line up behind one of those red ropes, and you buy your tickets down the hall. So I lined the kids up, went to buy the tickets. And as I walked away, a young man walked over to my students. He was about 23, 24. It was his job to take your ticket, tear it, let the rope, and take you into the theater. And he went over to the kids who were as quiet as you are right now, and he said, hey, are you guys having fun? And the kids went, uh-huh. <laughs> and he said, well, you sure are quiet. Yep. <laughs> well, what are you so quiet for? And one of the kids said, well, we're always quiet in public places. It's a level six thing. <laughs> and I was watching this, just loving being a teacher. And he pointed to a girl named Janet. Now, Janet was one of those kids who I thought I made no difference for at all. We were not close. She didn't give me a note at the end of the year. We didn't hold hands and sing Kumbaya. She was just one of the thousand kids I've known. But he pointed at Jenny and said, hey, you, what do you do for fun? And she said, I play the violin. And he said, oh, that's not fun. What do you do for fun? And she said, I love playing the violin. That's what I do. And he said, what's your favorite video game? And she said, I don't play them. He said, all kids play them. She said, I don't. I play the violin. He said, let me give you some advice. When you're young, don't listen to your parents. Don't listen to your teachers. You need to raise hell, run around, and have fun. All right! And I'm watching all this. I don't say a word. It's not my style. We went on the ride, and after the ride, I took the kids to me, and I said, you guys, I feel kind of bad. I, I know I have high expectations for your behavior, but I hope you don't think I'm taking away your fun. It's just, and before I could finish, a 10-year-old child named Catherine said, Rafe, that guy takes tickets in line for a tourist attraction. <laughs> she said, you think we're going to listen to him? I said, Catherine, you can now leave my class because I got nothing else to teach her. <laughs> but Janet, the girl that I didn't connect with, she wound up going to Notre Dame. She wrote an essay for Notre Dame. They get 20,000 essays a year. She never told me about it. But Notre Dame contacted me. And they said, it's the best essay they have ever received, ever, about education. I read this essay every day of my life at about 6.20 in a dark parking lot at Hobart to remind myself why I teach. I appreciate that you've listened to my words tonight, but they're not really that important. Please listen to Janet's words. They're much more important. She was asked to write about a childhood experience and what it meant to her. And she wrote about being in a play in my class, and here's how she ended it. All these plays were performed in our tiny classroom, room 56, and on that night of the final performance, I could only think to wish how I could stop time. I wish I could put all the feelings that evening into a jar and carry it around with me wherever I go because the emotions in room 56 that night were full of delight and passion and energy. Putting together those plays every year not only taught me about Shakespeare, but I learned about teamwork and humility and that when one of my fellow classmates was on stage, it was his turn to be in the spotlight, not mine. I learned about how to play many instruments because we incorporated pop songs into the scenes. I became aware of the value of responsibility and hard work. Who would have thought one could learn so much just by being in a play? I learned my most valuable lessons in Room 56, and I treasure all the experiences I had in that tiny little classroom. Hobart Elementary School is located in the heart of downtown Los Angeles. And as I look back at my elementary years, I think about the horrible environment I grew up in. There were kids who didn't know how to speak English, even teachers 
who didn't know how to speak English. A rape or abuse case occurred at least once a week at school, and policemen were seen frequently on campus. Yet during the fifth grade, when I walked into room 56, everything changed. The world outside stopped existing and disappeared. Instead of gang fights and beggars, my life turned into guitar lessons and history productions and Shakespearean characters. My fears and horrors were replaced by happiness and laughter. It became my second home and my classmates, my second family. I did most of my growing up in room 56 and it shaped and molded me into the person I've become now. No matter what else was happening anywhere in the world, all my troubles could be fixed in this safe haven. And I constantly retreated to it when I had family trouble. And even today, if I am looking for a place where there is only love and joy, and anger and hatred do not exist, I will still retreat to room 56. That's the challenge for all of you. Let us create safe havens where our students can flourish and become the extraordinary young people we know they're capable of becoming. And I'm so grateful to Salisbury for making this auditorium a safe haven for me tonight. Thanks for being such a great audience. Thank you, everybody.